Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. So welcome to this uh, open discussion uh, session. Um, you have uh, some experts here. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how often will it happen that you that you have the possibility to to shoot your questions like this, so take your your chance. Let's say um, here we have proposed some uh, some questions, some points, uh, which where is Stefan? I don't know. Stefan. <laughs> ah. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, there you have some uh, some questions, and the, the format that we propose is the following: you can you can pick up a question, and of course the seventh is uh, is open, it's completely open. You can ask anything you want. You can choose if you want to ask it to someone in particular, or if you just wanted to to ask it to the whole panel, and then they can choose. Now now we miss Bern. Ah, I hear Bern. Okay, so let's say, which, which of these topics do you want to, to go? I will uh, have a look at them. I mean, I will read them quickly. So the first one is, what are the low-hanging fruits? This is proposed by Ben. So what are, let's say, the, the quick wins, the, the, e the easy things that could, uh, let's say, pr let you produce something uh, quickly? Let's put it like this. Uh, the second is exactly the opposite. So what are the high-risk and high-benefit problems? What are the, the big challenges that might uh, ask you a lot of efforts to... To before, let's say, before you can produce something. Uh, the third is from, uh, from Javier. So can, can artificial intelligence really work better than the data that is used to train it? And is artificial intelligence delivering quality or just cost? The fourth is about the, oh, the role of open access and, and open source codes. So will, will the fluid mechanics community ever have something like ImageNet, let's say, where you can, that you can use to train your whatever you are, you are trying to train? Uh, the fifth is about the role of a funding agency. So we all know that uh, now this topic is really on the hype. There have been already some winters. There might be others. So what is the role of funding uh, agencies in this, in, uh, in promoting some directions? And, and what could happen if this collapse? The sixth is about discourse. So if you have any feedback about uh, this course, like some, some topics that, that, that you think that we should have uh, uh, discussed and we didn't enough, or, or I don't know, any feedback that, that, that you would like to give, or maybe the format, uh, it's open. And the seven is really open, so whatever you have in mind. Okay? So I don't know if you go like by, by vote. Or Yeah, like which one do you, you can ask? I mean, exactly. We can make a vote for each. No, the first one, first come, first served. Okay, number three. Number three to who? Uh, <laughs> guess it's Javier. So Javier, what do you think about the third? Uh. Okay. Yes. Okay. This, this comes because I I I am I am seeing more and more papers, and receiving more as a referee, unfortunately, about people who claim that they can do better than physics. Okay. Then my worry is, if you do better than physics, you are doing something wrong. Because physics is supposed to be truth, or we we aim for physics to be the truth. So if anybody claims that they can do the average stress equation better than the average stress equation, you, you can do it faster, but not better, I think. Okay? And then my, my question is that, are we just finding ways of doing something probably worse, but faster and cheaper? Or are we really getting something new out of artificial intelligence? Or are we ever going to get something new out, 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 out of artificial intelligence? That's my, that's my worry. I, that's, I, I, I basically think that up to now, what I have seen is, is a question of cost. You are doing something cheaper, which is okay. I mean, it's very 
especially from 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 the engineering point of view, is is, is very good. But they have seen very little new science coming out of of, of artificial intelligence. That that's my worry about this. I don't know what other people in the panel think. If anybody thinks something, sure. So I. I'll start. If you want, I mean, as you want. <laughs> um, I'm not obliged to. <laughs> so I would agree. I think it's an insightful thing to ask. The comment that I would make is that, you know, if we if we truly know that our system is governed by the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, then, like you said, it's going to be a lot harder. It's going to be hard to do better than that. But perhaps, if you if you relax the question a little bit, then it's possible that that data could be better do better than you know, some reduced physics model that you're perhaps looking at. Uh, or also there are cases where if you have a system that's sufficiently complex such that you don't know the physics in a tractable form. So, you know, if you have, I, I don't know, multi-phase reacting flow where you have a lot of uncertainty as to what everything is doing, then maybe the data could help you discover the physics in, in, in that sense. But that's perhaps a, a, a cheap. I mean, you, you tell me about a, f a problem which you don't know. I mean, you cannot use the physics in a tractable form. You have to find turbulence. Eh? <laughs> okay. Now, I mean, I, I've been talking this day with, with, I mean, somebody who is working in, in a non newtonian fluid. And that's certainly a case in which data can help. I mean, FINIP is not a good model, and we all know that FINIP is not a good model. If anybody, if by using data or any other way, can find a, a better model for FINIP or a better model for 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 LES, that would be perfect. I have not seen it happen, but I think that therefore should go more than that way than just trying to do things that we know faster. Well, I I think that uh, I have, I cannot uh, say that I don't agree. I totally agree with uh, what said. I, I have to say that doing things faster can be can be extremely useful sometimes, and it is also extremely extremely, extremely valuable. I was thinking about uh, a, about doing things faster. I was thinking about a, a proposal we submitted about the operating room scenario in which you have a controlled airflow which protects uh, the, the the patient from germs, bacteria and whatever. And then if you have a, a large data set, you can predict the instantaneous flow field according to the operating room scenario. Where is the surgeon? Where are the, the, the doctors and the other people? And then eventually plan some control. This is a bit uh, science fiction, but uh, in principle could be could be an option. So. Things faster could be also very important for uh, for the improvement of uh, of life. Of course, this would not be we re adding new science. Of course, eh? so the question: Can AI work better than the data used? I think if you just build a machine learning model, the answer is no your model would be as, exactly as good as the data you use to train it. We work with a physical system where we have additional knowledge. And so we can make our artificial intelligence models better than the data by incorporating things we know about the Navier-Stokes equations or the physics. So I think that's, that's a key distinction that we have. In fact, if you look at image sciences, uh, image recognition, some of the major advances, uh, there's a Max Planck Institute by Schkolkopf on, on this, uh, this topic. They're incorporating the physics of light and how it bounces off of the physical world into image classification and they're getting better performance in their machine learning algorithms. So they can do more than the data because they're incorporating known physics. Um, so that is certainly an opportunity that, that we have to improve uh, existing machine learning tools. Um, and I definitely agree with the other speakers that uh, there are areas where the physics is not known precisely where we can gain new understanding. Uh, we're not going to probably gain that much new understanding in fields where we have exquisite models of the physics. But again, we can solve these optimization problems that we couldn't solve previously, like in flow control, optimization, things like that.
Um, yeah, so um, in the very little experience that I've had with uh, data-driven reduced order modeling and control, uh, there's one thing that I've had uh, to struggle with. So when I'm formulating the problem for reduced order modeling or uh, from the data, that's a very, uh, like I'm able to formulate a problem. It's a clean problem which I can solve using some optimization methods and that's all fine. But um, once I get the model or the controller, uh, I have no way of knowing whether that controller is going to work on the full order model or not. And um, I just wanted to know if this is something that uh, others also experience. And if there are at least certain class of systems on which we know that we can put some theoretical guarantees on our reduced order controllers uh, on their performance. <laughs> I, I would say the answer is rather depressing and we can take the cylinder wake for instance so the, the cylinder wake has a beautiful history so you look in the JFM 1989 and you find Fox Williams publishing he can suppress vortex shedding by having a sensor here having an uh, acoustic actuation here, it, it corresponds to an oscillation of the, of, of the cylinder, and he found that he could suppress with this sensor information vortex shedding by one order of magnitude. Nobody believed it, so what has happened is the vortex shedding went down. So the vortex shedding was asymmetric and was sheeting the sensor. And then uh, um, uh, um, Kimon Rosopoulos was a bit smarter and said, okay, and now I'm, I'm, I'm smarter. I'll put another sensor on the other side. And, and so now the vortex street cannot um, um, escape. And he actually managed to control the vortex shedding in this plane, but essentially on the right and left, you had more vigorous uh, um, um, vortex shedding. And then there was another guy, Stefan Siegel. So he said, I will stabilize the whole cylinder wake just using these two sensors. I told him uh, this will not work, and now he's not in, in academia anymore. So, so, <laughs> so, 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 so the, 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 the cylinder wake shows you already the flow. Once you have model-based flow, the, uh, uh, the, the full plant will always try to sheet you. So the, the flow behaves like a naughty child in inventing new structures, satisfying your sensors, uh, uh, but, uh, um, uh, not, uh, but inventing new structures uh, essentially to do what it really wants. And, 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 and there, are, there are also cases where things are not controllable. For instance, if you have the cylinder wake here, if you put your sensors here, there are so many structures which the flow can invent that any reduced order model which you have will become superfluous, uh, will be invalidated at the moment you run some control. Or, for instance, take the cylinder wake here and you, you put a volume force up front. So you cannot stabilize the vortex shedding because the volume force can at best uh, act like an elongated body. So the vortex shedding will uh, occur further downstream. And so my experience with model-based control was typically like this. We, we had a, 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 a beautiful model and then we did the control. And the first thing which uh, um, the control did in a real plant, it uh, went to the region of invalidity of the model. And, and essentially you, get, you typically got worse instability or worse situation than you um, started with. with. So for fluid mechanics, I would say you have model-based control is a is a very dangerous path if you are, and and it works only under some very specific conditions. To perhaps try to summarize that, and I think sort of going off the lessons from Bernd's talk and his experience, it seems as though um, not only if you want to control the flow, do you need feedback, but you need some sort of feedback in your control design in the sense of potentially, yeah, model update or some of the um, methods that you that we were talking about where you can iterate with the full system in order to find something that works for the full system or has seen, um, has been able to go through this trial and error in feedback with the full system rather than just with a model. So you need feedback for your feedback. <laughs> on the on the on the other hand, I mean, when, when when I was seeing this morning your control on the on the jet, 
your rotating control on, on the jet. That looks like the blooming jet of, of Bill Reynolds. It's a combination of several actuations. Well, the, the blooming jet is also, you, first you have to pulsate it here, and then you have to to, to, to do it. And that was done with no feedback control. I mean, well, Bill Reynolds. This was also open loop control. So he started with feedback control, but the sensor reading was not used. Okay, well, I mean, in, in, in his case, he just understood what to resonate with what. I mean, there was a, a very simple-minded linear control, and it worked beautiful. I mean, the, the jet blew. Okay. Sure. At the moment, you want to excite a flow and use an instability. Easy play. Uh, but for this, you, you really don't really need a good model. It's, the problem um, um, starts when you want to make the flow something which it really does not like to do. For instance, you have a, have a wake and you have vortex shedding and you really want to kill the vortex shedding. So either you go to the, to the, to the full force solution, so you do big under forcing, but it's uh, uh, difficult to find, in quotation marks, a smart flow control solution where you, where you have a subtle... Uh, uh, um, it's, it's like making a joke. You, 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 you make a subtle actuation and, and you get a big laugh of the flow and, and you use the internal dynamics of the flow to achieve your goal so that you need very small actuation energy. So, so this is something which is uh, um, pretty, pretty rare. I'm sure that you're, you're, you're aware of this word, but I remember a paper by, I think it was by Dimotakis a long time ago. He put a flap in front of the, of the, of the cylinder and that killed the, the shedding. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. This is what you say, you can have authority. This is right. If you I put mean, the volume force on the right location, it was I, was can the, I mean, it was a flow. flap. It was a, yes, just a you can have a splitter plate. If the splitter plate has the right size and the, the right mm -hmm. location, you can uh, um, also suppress uh, uh, um, vortex shedding. So, so you can have authority, but you do not necessarily have to have authority. But I mean, that, that, there was another case in which he did it because he understood the. The, the, the system. I mean, in, in any case in which you have a, a model instability, which is typical of wakes and jets and shear layers, then you can, you, you know what to do, basically. The problem is when you don't have a model instability, and then you are doing, I mean, you are not really, you, you, you don't really know the system that you are controlling. I mean, how Let, Let's take one example. Suppose, for instance, does this discussion go too far? So let's say uh, I, I can. Okay. So <laughs> let's take, for instance, uh, um, uh, um, turbulent boundary layer control. You should be the expert. So uh, um, if if you want to make a control where essentially you can only afford to have a surface motion which has the same scale as a boundary layer thickness, you would say you would not initially imagine a mechanism which can do that. It turns out there is a mechanism. Uh, uh, Wolfgang Schröder did it, spanwise traveling wave. And, and so we get something like 31% drag reduction, very beautiful and it's uh, engineering. It's realizable also in the experiment, what you cannot say for local opposition control. So this is kind of an, a, a mechanism where you say, if you don't think extremely deeply about it, or if you don't see the results, you would not, you, you, you cannot possibly imagine this type of uh, um, 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 control. And is that model based? I mean, how did he get that? Well, this is open loop forcing, but it's a mechanism which you don't, um, um, which you uh, could not anticipate. Okay, and it was found. I mean, how was it found? How, how, pardon? How was it found? I mean, how did he? Tr well, uh, uh, by, 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 by having some, uh, um, um, uh, by some trial and error. He did some simulations and he figured out it reduces the drag and then he looked, oh, uh, uh, what is the mechanism? And of course, at some point we developed some models and, 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 and so on. Monte Carlo science. Well, maybe slightly better, smart Monte Carlo. <laughs> I've, uh, I'm taking notes, so I'm doing a dynamic summary. Um, so we, has, we have uh, said that uh, we, with AI we can do things uh, faster, we can even extract physics uh, or improve lower fidelity simulation approaches um, and all this kind of stuff. But, uh, uh, but there is this point that I really liked of how you extrapolate and that this is actually related to me also to this notion of uncertainty and uh, bridging scales. Uh, and so I was wondering, I don't know if I can have your opinion, how do you think, how do you see machine learning improving uh, the confidence that we have in uh, uh, numerical simulation to give predictions with the 
prescribed confidence intervals to take decisions, really take decisions based on simulations. Well, I'll say one thing, which is uh, uh, there's maybe a difference between having confidence and having misplaced confidence, but I'll let someone else elaborate. <laughs> yeah, um, good question. So yes, um, that's where I see one of the, the, the benefits um, uh, that we still have to harvest. Um, so, so I'm pretty fascinated by, by these Bayesian um, techniques, Bayesian regression. Um, and um, what we have to be careful about is um, what kind of confidence are we talking about? Are we really talking about confidence in the prediction or are we talking about uh, getting a feeling for the lack of data? Right. So um, I'm not sure if you, if you get the point, but um, the first time I saw confidence intervals uh, on, on um, yeah, Bayesian regression model prediction, uh, I believe that this is the, the error in the CFD prediction or the error in the, in the experimental data. But it was none of that. It was simply the, um, the combination of, uh, it, it was simply the fact that we didn't have enough data, right? And this was reflected in the confidence intervals. And once you dropped, once you put more data into, uh, into the uh, model, uh, these confidence um, intervals got smaller and smaller. Um, what I'm trying to say is I, I do have a hope that with uh, machine learning methods, be it support vector regression or these Bayesian methods, we are able to Given you quality to the predictions, right? But people have to understand what these uncertainties, these confidence intervals mean. And I'm not yet the expert, I'm, I'm learning, uh, but I think this is part of our job to educate people also on what they're looking at, right? Um, full stop. I mean, something that I thought was very interesting in your talk this morning is when you, I mean, when you were mapping your manifold and say, I need data there. And you, were, you, you went to, to put out some new data point there. I think that, I mean, to me, I'm sorry, but I, that, that's the part that, that, that your talk that I like best. That I, like best. I think that that's very relevant to this question of DMV. I mean, you, 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 you can add data, but you can add data in places that are, that are not important. But you are able to really um, shepherd your, 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 your data into places that, that is needed. I think that that would be very... A very, a very nice advance. So, so slightly related to this, um, I had a conversation today um, and the conversation reminded me of um, a story that is um, uh, taking us back to, um, to Sweden uh, in the, I guess, late, late 90s. Um, and um, the Saab company was building the Gripen aircraft. Um, and uh, in, in flight testing, they were experiencing interesting phenomena, right? Um, very nonlinear behavior uh, in flight, which nobody expected, right? And they, they didn't know what, where this came from. All the models, um, which were deterministic models, of course, couldn't predict this, right? So, and um, I think where machine learning can help us, so that's not exactly uncertainty, but uh, the, the lack of knowledge about of what's happening, right, caused uh, a problem in flight testing. And I think that machine learning um, can help us um, in detecting such such areas, right, or um, f just imagine classification algorithms, right? If we can classify areas of you know, for an aircraft areas of uh, the flight envelope which feature different physics, um, right, separation, no separation, shocks, no shocks, and this kind of stuff, uh, then we know that in between something is changing, right? And that's what I'm excited about. We had um, a, a measurement campaign in the wind tunnel of, of uh, future fighter aircraft configuration, and it also showed very nonlinear behavior um, uh, in a very small region of the flight envelope. Um, and I was thinking, well, if I had just uh, selected samples uh, left and right of that phenomenon, I would have put a straight line um, across this phenomenon. So I would have just missed it. Right? And I would be very excited. So this is some opportunities or high risk, high benefit. I would be excited about um, applying these methods to find um, phenomena that we missed so far. Not exactly uncertainty, but makes me excited. <laughs> so I do think that's an extremely interesting point, and I'll just um, kind of add on to that. We've been doing some work with Boeing on flight test evaluation, and a lot of what we're doing is taking uh, existing models and trying to find out when the data is anomalous. 
And so sometimes it's because your measurement was wrong, your sensor was off. Sometimes it's because there's something really interesting happening that you want to zoom into and build a refined model for. And, and I think that's absolutely right that that's very interesting. Because, of course, you have given examples of how you can use machine learning and also uncertainty quantification in a way to discover if there is missing physics. But the, the opposite, I think, is also true. Uh, and especially if you think, uh, now if you're familiar with the approach of Kennedy O'Hagan for uncertainty quantification, it's a Bayesian approach. And so the way, in fact, this was presented and introduced is that uh, you have a very pragmatic view on, uh, uh, on a model, and you can basically uh, um, modify the parameters uh, so that you have a good representation of what you think is the reality. And so this is something that in machine learning you could do with the regression problem, right? So you could actually optimize uh, a, a reduced order model of something. Huh? But then you risk to be missing out on the physics. So if your model is underperforming because there is a missing physics, there is also a risk that you actually miss out because you are just optimizing a reduced order model. And so you have off nominal values of your model because you are compensating for missing physics. So I don't know if you, have, you see a solution to this potential problem. So it's a sort of a regularization based on physics, um, let's say generalizable or possible. Well, I, I think that uh, you always have the risk of doing some uh, overfitting. I mean, if you have a, a model which is uh, not representative of the physics and you force it to, fix, uh, to fit some data, you end up having some parameters that uh, are eventually far from reality. And uh, here it should come uh, the, the expertise of the, of the person who is doing the, the study, the research, to, to identify that um, that if uh, a parameter of your model is uh, is evidently wrong, eventually, or your model is wrong, or your data might be wrong, because uh, especially when you do experiments, you have a lot of sources of uncertainty, and also this should be should be taken into account. Do you have uh, other questions? Hmm? There are many questions. Sorry. Uh, microphone. May I? Hello. Uh, I'd like to ask the question number four to anybody, basically. Which, by the way, there's a typo, as usual. Yeah. Time. And in particular, I, I would like to add that I worked a bit in the field of like um, machine learning and redu reducer reduction. And I, I am under the impression that this kind of methodologies like deep neural network are really cool if you have already the data set but in our case you have to generate the data set and it can be a bit problematic or at least super expensive so from a very pragmatic point of view of view what what do you think about like applying this methodology in a case where like uh, you need the data set and you, and you don't have like a library an open source library where to learn the flows or you have a huge data set for free Towards the question, it's to me. <laughs> no, I mean, if I can say something about databases, I host a database of turbulence data, which is like a petabyte. It's free for anybody who goes in there, but it's a petabyte. So, and that, that is my database. There is the one in Johns Hopkins. I mean, there are several very large scale databases for fluid mechanics, uh, I mean, turbulence data, basically. And I mean, that, those are time resolved, space resolved data of flow fields for long times. The problem is that it's a petabyte. I mean, the, the way we are handling this up to now is I organize every two years a summer school, people come and use it. Or maybe somebody visits for a, I mean, for a, for a while. We have not found a, a practical way of sharing anything bigger than 10 teras. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people come with a bunch of disk and, and take it away and they use it. I mean, I, and I, I don't want to know what they do with it. Huh? <laughs> 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 
But if I may, may add to this, uh, the other big problem I think in the in our field is is in a way to know what is the question that you want to ask with this data. So if you have uh, tons of images about cats and dog because you want to see if if you, if your if your neural network can recognize cats and dog, that that's one thing. But but when you have uh, thousands of uh, of uh, flow fields about about the boundary layer or about or about a, a weight flow or, or or whatever, then you have to see what is the question. So if the question is as general as uh, can the neural network learn Ivy Stokes, uh, or or is it yeah. something like uh, can I use it to to yeah, find? My, my out question was more like uh, from a very pragmatic point of view, like an engineering point of view. I want a result. Are these methodology really much better than like a classical approach, a CFD approach, or can they get better in the future? But let's put it like this. What will you, what do you look for in a data set? Let's say you're looking for some data to do what, for example? I don't know, a drag, a drag but, around uh, an airfoil or... Like for, exa for instance, you want to predict drag, drag. So you want a model that uh, helps you to predict the drag as a function of the Reynolds in a particular configuration. This is a very specific uh, question, I guess. So you, you will need the configuration that is similar to yours. Otherwise you fall back on the, on the course of extrapolation. So, I mean, in, in this, for this specific question, personally, I see it quite, quite hard. I mean, a good use, for example, could be, let's say you want to develop a new turbulence model, a closure problem. So somehow you want to identify, uh, to find a new law for your eddy viscosity or something like that. Then you have tons of data in many cases and, and use this data to do a, a regression. So it's a very specific problem. So for things like this, I, I would say it is very, very interesting. Maybe Bern, you want maybe two two answers to your question. Number one, you can do a very smart use of the literature database. For instance, if you are interested in drag, let's say lift, you are interested in lift. So what we are doing in Braunschweig, we go through. Uh, um, a roughly order of thousand of profiles, uh, different Reynolds numbers, different Mach numbers, and we build our model based on the literature. And then you give us a new profile and, and, and tell us the Reynolds number and the Mach number, and, and it's probably more accurate in predicting uh, um, the lift than a, than, a, than a run server. So these are ways in which you can uh, um, essentially train uh, your uh, regression problem or your mapping um, um, from, from the shape uh, uh, to your um, cost function. And it always assumes you can always do these things if you don't have to do extrapolation, if you, uh, if you can do it by interpolation. But there are some things where you can do it. If you have another question, say another, where should I place my actuator uh, for an arbitrary shape uh, um, to get the maximum drag reduction we will never have enough data. So this is a problem which you cannot ask. Uh, uh, but no, no, now there's one big uh, question in our field, namely the closure. Can we do anything better than the Smagorinsky closure or the uh, um, eddy viscosity closure? It's a bit depressing. So since 1877, uh, we always rediscover business uh, eddy viscosity with some small knobs. Now the next question is, can you do anything better? My claim is yes. Uh, and probably you need something like uh, 100 different flows with 1,000 snapshots uh, um, um, each. And then you train your closure models on different model, and you should do it with a cross validation. So you should uh, uh, um, um, train it maybe on 50 configuration and test it on the other 50 configuration and use this as your error. And this can uh, probably lead to, to much better closures than we have at the moment. And what I would imagine is that you probably get something like the eddy viscosity, the next thing is the distance to the wall which plays a role, then the next thing is uh, um, the direction uh, uh, from the wall. So there may be a, a couple of geometrical parameters which you have to the eddy viscosity in order to get a much better turbulence control. But, but, but this can only be determined if you have a rich enough uh, um, um, database. So you have some data. It's, it's very important to have many different flows if you want to propose any new closure. No, no, no. I mean, it's not me. I mean, you, you, you want to use that. I mean, where, where are you going to, to, to go to Stanford? I mean, the CTR. 100 different flows, not one. Thing. Probably, no, probably. They, they have 100 different flows. Okay. I mean, they have been doing this for, for 40 years now. Okay. Uh, wakes, uh, uh, channels, boundary layers, uh, separated flows, diffuser. 
and they have uses exactly for that. And they, they produce the subgrid models, which are better than a Maurisky static. I mean, the, the dynamic model works fairly well. Mm -hmm. And uh, Paul Durbin has this, this um, relaxation model, I think he calls it, that has to do with the, the, with the distance to the wall. Actually, he solves up. Wall function, yes, sir. Well, it's not a wall function. It's slightly more complicated than a wall function because he solves like, like, like a Poisson equation for the renal stresses near the wall or something like that. Yeah. But I mean, th th those things are done and they have been going on for a long time. And the, the, place, the place for that is, is, is Stanford. Moin has been doing that for, for a long time, pre precisely for that. But how generalizable is that? I mean, does it mean that if we have enough data set, we can create some new turbulence model that can replace uh, any other computation? What? I mean, um, I just put, <laughs> yeah, wanted to ask a similar oh. question. Okay. You have the rich database, you have this wonderful, I don't know, neural network that predicts perfectly turbulence. At that point, would that be the end goal? Would, would you model and analyze any flows with that thing, or would you use it to maybe like find a new equation the old-fashioned way? Or would that? So, if, if you think you, you tra have trained your neural network on data which is dense, that means if you think uh, you have a, a good interpolative tool, uh, 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 fine, then it uh, sh should work, but, but it, it, it is, uh, uh, we're, we're, in, c in case you want to predict, for instance, the, the, the lift of an airfoil, you replace a run simulation. So essentially you reduce your computational cost by doing a reasonably clever interpolation. And so it's very specific. If you are asking about the flow structures of, uh, say, arbitrary possible um, um, obstacles, I don't think that uh, the data will... You can always generate something new. That means uh, you always have to do extrapolation. And whatever neural network uh, you, 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 you have, it will miss something unless you ask, say, a, 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 a very good, very universal question. I think that's actually too pessimistic. I mean, there's a lot of physics 